Today's going to be a great day, guys. Uh, we're going through Numbers chapter 16. And um, I'm going to ask all of you right now, who here plays sports? Any type of sports. Who here plays instruments, music in any way? Awesome. God has given all of you so many gifts, and it's amazing to see. Uh, we're going to talk briefly about sports here. By the way, Niners fan, great jacket over there. Uh, football season's here. <laughs> football season's here right now. So we're going to talk a little bit about the two things right now. So in sports, you have a coach, correct, guys? Yeah. That you listen to, correct? And you have a specific job, a specific role that you play within the sport, right? If you're in football, you're a wide receiver, you're not the quarterback. And if you're a wide receiver and you tell a coach, yo, I want to be the quarterback, the coach can tell you, no, listen to me, you're a wide receiver. That's what you're going to do. I have the quarterback over here. You do your job to win the game, right? If you try to disobey the coach, odds are he's going to sit you. That's how it works. Or she's going to sit you. For music, kind of the same, a similar scenario, by the way. If you're playing in an orchestra, if you're playing uh, maybe you're in a choir of some sort, the conductor is the one who is leading everything, correct? Yeah. If you are a violinist and you decide, no, conductor, I want to play the trumpet, and he says, no, we're, you're going to play the violin, he's going to play the trumpet, or she's going to play the trumpet. That's what we're going to do. Why? Because we want it to sound good for the audience right after, correct? That's what you do. But if you disobey, odds are you're going to sit because it's, disrupt, it's disruptive to the rest of the group here. So keep this in mind, this idea of obedience that we're going to be talking about. There's two words I want us to think about as we go through this. One, I want to define authority. Okay, authority. So I'm going to define, define it in this way. Authority. It's a leader placed over you to lead by example, training, and commandments. They give you commandments that you are to obey. These are the people that are placed in authority over you. Okay? Another word I want us to think about, you're going to hear me say this word a lot. And this word is submit. Submit means to accept and obey another. Or in this case, accept and obey the leader. Okay? Authority that's placed over you. So these are two words I'm going to be saying a lot, and that's what I want you guys to think about as we go through. Okay, so in Numbers chapter 16, you guys ready? Open up your Bibles in Numbers chapter 16. Numbers chapter 16. One second, I forgot to turn my time on here. There we go. Now, a question I want you guys to think about as we go through number 16 is what motivates you, OK? If you are a, a, a player, is your motivation to do what you can to, win, to help the team, or is it to make yourself look better? If you are playing an instrument, is your, is your motivation to do what you can to help the band, or is it so that you can look better? What's your motivation? What drives you? In other words, what is most important to you? This is a question I want you to think about. What motivates you? What's most important to you? Again, also as we go through Numbers chapter 16. So that's a big question that you're going to hear me ask you over and over again, OK? All right. So Numbers chapter 16, we're going to read verses 1 through 2. Now Korah, Korah is a main subject here, OK, or person here that we're going to talk about. Now Korah, the son of Ishar, son of Kohath, son of Levi, and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and on the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. And they rose up before Moses with a number of the people of Israel, 250 chiefs of the congregation chosen from the assembly, well-known men. Now, when the Bible says rose up, by the way, that means that they are challenging. They're rising up against Moses and Aaron. God placed Moses and Aaron as leaders over Israel. They're like the coaches of Israel in this sense, okay, right? Or the uh, conductor in this sense. They are the leaders over Israel right now that God has placed. Korah, several others, and 250 total men are rising up against them now. They're challenging them. They're saying, no, why do you guys get to be leaders over us? We want to be leaders. That is what they are doing. 
they want to challenge specifically the priesthood, okay? So in other words, uh, God has placed priests there who represent man to God. That is their entire mission. They're the ones who represent man to God. And God speaks to Moses, and through the priests, they then also speak to the rest of the people. Korah saying, no, I want to be that priest. So he challenges them. Now, what is Moses' response to this? Let's read right now Numbers chapter 16, verses 8 through 10. You guys ready? Numbers 16, 8 through 10. And Moses said to Korah, Hear now. Listen up. Hear now, you sons of Levi. Is it too small a thing for you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do service in the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister to them? And that he has brought you near him and all your brothers, the sons of Levi, with you. And would you seek the priesthood also? So keep this in mind. Korah is not a priest. He is a Levite, okay? But Korah's entire job and his descendants, they actually have a very important job within the congregation. So we have these, the sacred artifacts that God has within the tabernacle, guys. You guys listen up here. We have the sacred artifacts that God has for the, in the temple. Remember, Israel is in the wilderness. They're in wandering around in the wilderness, which means these sacred artifacts and the Ark of the Covenant need to be moved around as well. Problem is, you can't touch the artifacts, otherwise you die. Yes. So the priests, Eleazar specifically, you're awesome, and that's correct. They're the ones who take care of the tabernacle, the, tabernacle, the, the artifacts in the tabernacle, the sacred things. But when they move around, what they do is they basically cover them up, and Korah and his descendants are meant to carry those around. So they carry these artifacts around when they move around, and they place them wherever the priests desire them to be placed. That is Korah's job. But He's not a priest. His job is to carry these things. And he also ministers to the congregation. Korah, though, he wasn't content with this. See, a lot of us have a job, and oftentimes we may not be content. And how, what's a good sign that you're not happy with your job or content with it? You start to complain, and you start to grumble. And Korah is grumbling and complaining because he's saying, God, I want more than this. I want to be the authority. I want the priesthood. Catch this, though. Korah's motivation is to be an authority and to be the priest. But look at Numbers 16, verses 8 through 10, when Moses talks to Korah. What should have been the motivation? There's, there's one phrase that's mentioned twice, okay? Let's start in verse 9. It says, is it too small a thing for you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you, I want you to hear it, say it out loud, to bring you near to himself. Now I'll go down to verse 10. It says, and that he has brought you, read it out loud, near him. Korah's motivation was he wanted to be his own authority and be the priest. He was not content with just being the man in charge of, of um, delivering the artifacts from one place to the other, transporting it. His motivation should have been being near to God. That's what it should be. And everything we do, the motivation should be draw near to God. So I want point number one up here. Point number one says seek to draw near to God. Seek to draw near to God. We're going to bring it back up again uh, after this. Just a quick minute. Seek to draw near to God. Again, going back to Numbers chapter uh, 16, verses 8 through 10, those were the things. <clears throat> It should not have been, hey, I want my own authority. It should have been drawing near to God. Now, here's a, a, a passage. We'll actually move on to the next passage here. In Psalm chapter 84, verses 1 through 2. 
Psalm 84, verses 1 through 2 says, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Look at these words. How lovely is your dwelling place? That should be our desire. How lovely is your dwelling place? Paul in the scriptures in Colossians chapter 3 also tells us to look to above, basically look to the heavens, not what's below. We are called to look at what is unseen, God where he's at, not what is seen. Why? Because he is good, guys. Whatever you do, whatever your motivation is, it should be drawn towards seeking him and drawing near to him. When you are complaining and grumbling, you tend that is a great sign that, again, you are not looking to seek God. And that's what was happening here with Corey. He wasn't content with, with being near to God. He, was, he wanted more than that, okay? In other words, he wanted his own authority. But here in Psalm 84, 1 through 2, it says, My soul longs. It wants to be in the courts of the Lord. That's the desire here. Yes, what was your, what was your motivation for coming here to church? That's a good question. What's the motivation for coming to the church? You should ask yourself that. Is it because your soul longs to be with the Lord, to be uh, for the courts of the Lord here? That is the, our, our motivation here. So how do you be near to God, by the way? How do you be near to God? Well, I'll give you some points here. There's a lot of different things that we could definitely get into, but I'm going to give you some four points that you're going to hear a lot from myself, from other teachers, and you're going to say, this is kind of repetitive. You want to know why we repeat it? Because it's important. So uh, I'll give you uh, four points here. Ready? First one, how to be near to God? Prayer. Pray, pray, pray. We have access to the Father through Christ Jesus, and he commands us to pray to him. In other words, talk with God. Talk to him. You, it's really hard to be in a relationship, to have a friend, for example, if you don't talk. Imagine, you know, I'm sure you all have good friends. You all have parents. You all have a great relationship. Imagine trying to keep that relationship, but you don't talk to them. It's really hard. It's actually impossible. So here, we're talking about praying to God. So one prayer. Second thing, read your word. We have the Bible here. Whoops. We have the Bible here. This is God's word. Read it. Come alongside your teachers. Come alongside the leaders in your life and read the word. This is God's word spoken to you. Next thing, fellowship with other people, other believers. Fellowship with other believers. Now, what I mean by this, by the way, specifically believers here, we're talking about people who are like-minded. Hang out with one another. You know, invite people over, right? Make sure that you are with other believers, people who also love the Lord. We tend to, um, we draw near to God by also drawing near to one another. Obey his commandments. That's another one. Fourth. We're going to get into that one pretty heavy here. Obey his commandments. Drawing near to God. <laughs> Jesus says, if you love me, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. Draw near to him. So again, the question is, what, is, what motivates you? What is your desire? Draw near to God. All right, guys. Numbers. We're going through the rest of this part. Okay, Numbers chapter 16, verses 12 through 35. I'm going to tell you the story for the sake of time here. All right, so Numbers chapter 16, verses 12 through 35 onward. What happens here now, guys, listen up. Korah, Korah goes against Moses. Korah and 250 plus men go against Moses right now, saying we basically want, we, we want, we're challenging you, we want the priesthood. And Moses commands 250 men, all of them, to bring incense to the Lord, Right? This is something only the priests really should be doing, bringing incense. But he's saying, okay, you want to be priests, everyone come here with incense. In other words, they're burning fragrance is what it is inside these censers. That's what they're bringing to the Lord. So he commands them to all do this. And God, what does he do? He commands a congregation, those who want to be saved, to be spared, to move away from Korah and the household and their tents. And what does God do to them? God opens up the ground. Guys, God opens up the ground like a massive sinkhole and their entire household and all of the people there fall in the ground. Hundreds, thousands of feet, we don't know exactly, but they fall down to their death. And then, it doesn't stop there. It's not like a sinkhole where it opens up 
a sinkhole basically is when a ground you know, caves in on itself. It's not like a hole that opens up and stays open. God, after that, closes it. So they're gone. That's God's judgment on Korah and his household in this moment. Okay? Now there's 250 men left. God didn't actually uh, uh, destroy them by tossing them down in the depths of the earth. He burns them. He sends fire and consumes 250 men. Okay? This is God's righteous judgment because they rebelled against his holy name. They rebelled against his authority, and they rebelled against those who he put in authority over them, by the way. It is very important to submit to the authority that God placed over you. So point number two, submit to the authority that God has placed over you. Submit to the authority that God has placed over you. Numbers chapter 16, verse 28. Actually, we'll keep this up, my bad, so that they can write it. Give it a quick minute. Okay. Numbers chapter 16, verse 28. This is is Moses speaking. And Moses said, Hereby you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, and that it has not been of my own accord. You see, Moses, his entire mission, guys, listen up. Moses himself, he tells them all, guys, listen up. All this is happening to show you that I have been sent by God. I am chosen by God to be authority over you, and I'm not doing my will. It is God's will, okay? 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. We're going to bring that verse up, okay? Please write down 1 Peter 5, 5. Okay, never mind. I thought they had that up. It's all good. Um, I'll read it to you. Just write down 1 Peter 5.5. 5. It says, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to your elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. You who are younger, be subject to your elders, okay? Clothe yourselves with humility. In other words, say, I accept you as the leader, and I'm obeying you. So what are the leaders that God has placed over you? That's the question, guys. All right. What are the authorities that God has placed over you? Okay, here we go. One is government. And when we think of authority, we think of police officers, we think of kings, we think of queens, presidents. Absolutely, the government is in authority, okay? They have authority that God has placed there, and we are called to obey them. That's what we're called to do. We'll move down, though. Teachers. Some of you are homeschooled. Parents are the teachers. Obey them. Some of you go to a school. God has placed them in his authority over you. Remember, if your motivation is to draw near to God, this should be something that comes to you because you want to listen to God in this sense, in this way. Teachers. Next one, spiritual leaders. Look around. Kids, I want you to look around at all the leaders in this room right now. They are right now in this place as spiritual leaders over you in authority right now. Listen, respect, and obey them. That's what you're called to do, okay? Elders, pastors, that's what we do. We obey the leaders, the spiritual leaders of this congregation. Last but not least, for sure, parents. God has placed you into their lives and has placed them as authority over you. So obey your parents. Scripture is very clear to obey your parents in Ephesians chapter 6, 1. Obey your parents and Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother for this is the, uh, this is the first commandment with a promise. That is how beautiful it is. God really desires you to obey your parents. In all of this, we obey God, by the way. Even when I'm speaking up here, right? Sorry, my bad. Let me backtrack. In all of this, we obey God. The government, all of it. If someone commands you to sin, you clearly don't sin, right? If someone commands you to sin, don't do that. If a teacher or coach or someone tells you to do something that's, you know, go steal this, that's not obeying God. Ultimately, you obey God. If I'm up here speaking to you and I speak something that's not in the scripture, that's what you don't obey. You even test me to the scripture because God himself is ultimate authority. But God has placed these people in your lives as authorities over you. So how do we honor God? How do we draw near to him? Obey his commandments is absolutely one of those ways. Obey your leaders. Do not complain. Do not grumble is what the scripture says here. Okay? All right. Don't be Korah. 
That's probably like the answer of the day. Don't be Korah. So <laughs> don't grumble. Don't complain, okay? Be content and understand that God has you where he has you right now and utilize the gifts that he's given you for his glory. Okay, Numbers chapter 16 through 17. We'll kind of finish off everything else right here, okay? Numbers 16, uh, verses 36, all the way through. We're going to finish chapter 17. So in this way, Israel, by the way, instead of learning, Israel just saw a bunch of people get swallowed up by the earth. And then fire came down and burnt a bunch of others. And then guess what they did after that? They grumbled and complained. They didn't fall on their knees and obey God. They grumbled more. And they ended up telling Moses, you killed these good people, is what they were saying, ultimately. These were good people of our congregation. Why'd you kill them? We rebelled against God, basically good people, people who are upright in their, in their congregation. That's who they thought. How backwards is that, guys? That is so backwards. Okay? These weren't good people. They were leading them astray and away from God. They wanted to be in rebellion against God. That's what they did. So God produced judgment, and Israel complains from here. So what does God do even further? He brings more judgment in this case. He brings a plague that kills 14,700 people. 14,700 people are killed in this, uh, from this plague. Moses commands Aaron at this point, saying, Aaron, go to the people, to, or take incense from the, uh, from the tabernacle. Go to the people and burn incense as an atonement for their sins. And God immediately um, uh, forgave, them and, uh, forgave them and actually removed the plague from, the, from their midst. So 14,700 people died, and from there, Mo Aaron makes an atonement. Remember, he's a priest who represents the people in this case. So he's saying, God... Please accept this atonement. Atonement means cover up, or in this case, take away sin so that we can be right with God. That's what atonement is, taking away the sins so we can be right with God. Aaron does this to, uh, for, uh, for Israel, makes an atonement for them. Aaron's a priest, guys. That's what he is. Do you know who our high priest is today? Jesus, he's our high priest. And he is the one who came ultimately to remove sin, to take away the sins of the world so those who believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. Point number three, submit and trust Jesus, our high priest. Submit and, and trust Jesus, our high priest. I have about two minutes roughly here to wrap up, so i got to move on from here as you guys take the notes. But in Numbers chapter 17, verse 13, it's an interesting question that Israel asks. Israel asks, everyone who comes near, who comes near to the tabernacle of the Lord shall die. Are we all to perish? I mean, that's a good question. The people who come to the tabernacle, they die. They can't get near God. They all die. Are we all to perish? And the answer is, on your own authority, on your own terms, yes, you are to perish. We can't get near him. But this is where Jesus comes in, and it's amazing, right? Think of the word perish. That makes us think of one of the most uh, popular verses of all time, John 3, 16, right? Right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That is an incredible question that Israel does ask, and rightfully so. Will we all perish? And thank God he sent his son Jesus, who came, died on the cross for our sins, was buried for three days, rose again on the third day, and right now is alive, seated right at the right hand of the Father, and is king and authority over all creation. And we here, and he made the atonement by his sacrifice, he made the atonement so that for us, if you repent and put your faith in him, we will not perish, but we will have eternal life. That is the gospel, guys. And God shows mercy to those who believe in Christ. God even showed mercy even in this moment for Israel for, from incense, by the way. He burns incense. He, show, he shows mercy to them. Here's a fun fact about mercy, by the way. Really cool here. I'm just going to throw this out there. So Psalm 84 we just read. Remember, Korah and his household got, were swallowed up by the earth. Psalm 84 is written by Korah's sons. That's mercy. 
God actually spared some of his sons and his descendants as well who decided to remove themselves from his household. His own sons wrote 11 of our psalms. It's an amazing mercy that we see from God. That is really cool. So um, I wanted you guys to get this and understand this, that Jesus is our high priest. Yes, we submit to all authority. By submitting to the authority, we're ultimately submitting to Jesus. And by seeking him and drawing near to him, we are saved. That's the motivation that I am asking you guys um, here right now. So I'm not going to... Yeah, we'll stop right there, guys. So let's pray with me, please, and then we'll get into the questions. Lord God, we thank you for everyone here. We thank you, God, for sending your son, Jesus, to be that high priest who sacrificed himself for our sins, God. Thank you so much for your mercies, for being here with us, God, and for um, and just for the love that you have for us, God. We love you because you first loved us. I ask that everyone here, God, will... Uh, will put their trust in you, God. We'll trust you fully as our authority, as our king, um, and that everyone here as well, God, will, uh, will continue to live our lives, Lord, to glorify you by also submitting to one another, submitting to our leaders. We love you and thank you and ask that we would just draw near to you in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen.